the purpose of these laws was to take control away from people. Are there going to be any restrictions on the rights and privileges and the concessions? The terms privileges and concessions come from British forest law, which refuse to recognize any rights. What is a forest? If you scan the statute books of India, you will not find the definition of this word. <coughs> the word forest is not defined in Indian law. It is defined only in one 1996 order of the Supreme Court, which very unhelpfully says a forest is that area which fits the dictionary definition of a forest. <laughs> And as one of the lawyers who argued that matters, but they didn't tell us which dictionary. So there are two key features of, of, uh, of the Indian Forest Law, particularly if you look at the Indian Forest Act, which is a sort of mother legislation. The first is that uh, any land area can be brought under government control as a reserved forest or as a protected forest. That's why they don't define the term forest. The intention was to leave it flexible and open, that any area of land can be brought under government control. And the second thing is that even, even till today, despite all the reforms and all the, I mean, putting it somewhat cynically much, a great deal of talk, Indian Forest Service plans that are produced by Forest Service officers still revolve around timber. If you look at working plans, they're still basically concerned with timber. And most training of Forest Service officers continues to be about silviculture, raising and maintaining of, t of, of trees. And this, as I said, springs from a certain colonial history. Now, in this environment, when the British wanted timber and they wanted to take it out of these forests, these forests, after all, were not uninhabited wildernesses. Especially in South Asia, they have always been inhabited, used, cultivated, and depended upon by people. So it wasn't that the British came in and imposed a management system on a vacuum. They came in and they imposed a system on something that already existed, which is a whole complex system of various local forms of management, etc. So the purpose of these laws, and the British are very open about this if you read their original historical documents, the purpose of these laws was to take control away from people. And I think this is something that we need to keep in mind when we consider the safeguards that Dr. Kishwan was referring to about people's rights. He used an interesting word, rights, privileges, and concessions. The terms privileges and concessions come from British forest law which refused to recognize any rights in most reserved forests and instead converted them into what they called privileges and concessions which could be modified, regulated, and withdrawn at any time by the concerned forest officials. So, we, so, and it is for this reason that you have huge areas of land that were declared to be forests even though they were actually, they, in some cases they were never forests at all. The state of Himachal Pradesh has a recorded area of 60, a recorded forest area of 66% of the state's land area. Whereas, geographically, only 30% of the state can support forest, because the rest is mountains. So you have a situation on the ground where, uh, where you, the, this chaos in the records reflects the chaos on the ground, which is that actually you have a legal regime which prescribes very stiff restrictions. The Wildlife Protection Act is one of India's most draconian laws. You know, it presumes guilt. <coughs> It, put, it, it denies bail for a period of uh, more than a year in certain offenses. On a second offense, you, it imposes a minimum sentence of life imprisonment. I mean, it's one of India's stiffest laws. And on the ground, you have millions of people living in and breaking these laws every day because they have to survive. That's in this context that we are talking about bringing in red. That red, again, just like the original forest laws, red is not entering a vacuum. Red is entering a situation which, figuratively, and in some parts of India, literally, is a situation of war. And this is true of most forest areas in India today, because people are pitted against an official machinery, which, is, which in law, and which on record, is intended to deny them their rights. In the same manner, we have joint forest management, in the question of sharing of benefits on River Red, I want to bring up this point. The principle of joint forest management, a highly problematic program, so I'm not going into much detail, but one of the principles was that there will be revenue sharing that uh, from the timber from the for forests that are protected with so-called community <coughs> participation. 50, it, it varies from state to state. Some cases 20% of the village, some cases 50% of the village, some states it's mostly 100% of the village. Uh, I challenge you, go to any village in India that is has a JFM committee and ask them how much revenue they have received in the 20 years of JFM policy has been practiced, you will find it is zero. 
in Gujarat, where there are several thousand villages practicing JFM. Mostly, they're practicing JFM protecting so-called degraded forest land, which include large bamboo stands. Exactly three villages have received revenue from bamboo sales since the JFM program began. So the so what I'm coming back to saying essentially is that we are in, now bringing in red into a framework which one I raise the point that it is a war zone. The other is that you are bringing it into a framework where there is a very powerful vested interest that is already operating, and which will therefore sh and that vested interest unfortunately is the government. You know, it is not, so the government in this question is not a neutral body, but it, it is the government which has a direct interest in denying rights. So in this context, now let's think about what RED <coughs> does. Now RED does two things, both of which Dr. Kishwan referred to. One, it makes forests into carbon repositories. Now we may say at the policy level, the international agreement does say so, that this should not be done. But if you are paying money, if the developed countries are paying money either through carbon trading or through their own government funds, if you are paying money in the name of preserving forests in order to become carbon sinks, you are in fact making them into carbon regulators. Whether you say you are doing so or not doing so is a different matter, you are making them into that. So you are sharply increasing the value of one aspect of a forest, which is trees. So it is actually the, the only type of uh, forest vegetation which can be guaranteed to be a carbon sink is rapidly growing young trees, which means essentially plantations in the Indian economy. So we are, so we are in other words, in building an incentive model which attributes a very high financial value to a certain type of growing trees. The second thing is that RED creates a financial architecture that is basically about trading. Now, whether it is concerned with market trading or not market trading is a different matter. Basically, you are saying that reduction of emissions here should count against increase or ex stable emissions there. And CSE raises a very good point in their pamphlet, if you'll see, that you're comparing apples and oranges here. Because the reduction in emissions from protecting forests or from growing trees is from existing, is from present day carbon that is already above ground. Like even trees that, were, that have recently grown or trees that in, in a currently existing forest consist of carbon that is absorbed from the, the, the atmosphere at most over the past century. And you are using this carbon to compensate carbon that has been emitted from fossil fuels which have been locked underground for millions of years. So the net amount of carbon in the atmosphere will increase if you have, these, if you have uh, this, this sort of a trading on almost that many. So, so red, in other words, is permitting industrial nations to get away with increasing pollution while giving us certain stops, which in turn will introduce more conflict and more problems in our countries. <coughs> this is the, at, at a very fundamental level of principle. As I said, I'm not going into technical discussions over safeguard policies and so on. But at a very fundamental level of principle, there is something wrong with this, with this approach. And this becomes finally and doubly problematic in the context of Red Plus, which the government of India has been one of the main uh, uh, in a sense supporters of this approach. Which at a certain level, there's a logic to it, which the government of India says that after all, we are supposedly not clearing large areas of our forest. In fact, the amount of natural forest in India that is being destroyed is high, in high dispute. As I said, what we are talking about is tree cover, which is not at all the same thing as forest. But the government of India says that our tree cover is not decreasing. So we are going to be penalized, and you're going to give money to people who are cutting down lots of trees, like Brazil and Indonesia and so on. And because we are not cutting down trees, you won't pay us to stop cutting down trees. So this is perverse. There's a logic to it. But the problem is, again, you insert it into this complex system that exists on the ground, and the result is very dangerous, which is that basically you are saying, let us support planting of trees. Now we talked about, uh, Dr. Gishwan referred to plantations in forest fringe villages. Plantations are a huge source of conflict in India today. So they are a standard method, and I can tell you this also from the areas that I have worked, in Tamil Nadu and in Maharashtra. Now the standard method by which the forest department takes over people's land is to plant trees on them. Like you go bung, I mean, this, this just happened last week in Odisha, where you go uh, on lands that people have legal rights to now under the Forest Rights Act. Anyway, the forest officers went in and planted trees on them. And people came and uprooted them. And that becomes a criminal case, because you have cut down, you have destroyed a tree in a forest area. So, the, so whereas actually that land doesn't belong to the forest department, it belongs to people. 
And in this, these JFM committees were being touted, and in fact, the government of India has, in the Green India mission, in its official submissions on red, and in its technical paper on carbon absorption by India's forests, it constantly talks about joint forest management as the technical, as the uh, mode by which the participation and rights of people will be safeguarded. These joint forest management committees, the secretary is a forest guard. As I said, there is no revenue sharing. So if there is no revenue sharing and you don't control the committee, why will anybody participate? So in practice, those who end up on these JFM committees in most areas are the local contractors, traders, and others who are close to the forest officials, because they're effectively appointed by the forest department. I think my point would be that before, in any South Asian country, and again, I can only, basically only speak from my experience about India, but I, I wager the same thing is true in most countries. Before entering this red thing, we must do it with our eyes open. So this is an inherently very dangerous proposal. And it is a proposal, dangerous not only to the local communities concerned, it's dangerous to the, to the whole system. Because you are one, you are accelerating conflict, you are impoverishing people who are already the poorest people of your country, and you are creating a system which allows the industrial countries to carry on emitting more and more carbon in the name of giving you some crumbs, which then induce civil war in your country. And, uh, and without addressing climate change. And the physical effects of climate change itself are already going to wreak havoc in water in many of these areas in, in any case. So you are, I mean, red is often touted as a win-win solution. And it's been advertised as the one thing which many, most of the governments of the world agree upon. I would, I would propose to you today it's not a win-win solution, it's a lose-lose solution. In fact, no one gains in this. Excepting those, I mean, it, it may not happen in India, it may happen in other places, but those private companies who engage in carbon trading and the industrial countries governments. No one else gains from this arrangement. And so, I, so when we are discussing it, I think it would be good if we kept these issues in mind.